Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's presentation on the permeable reactive barrier. Uh, my name is Scott Steer from GeoEnviroPro. Our presenter this morning is Pete Craig from GeoSolutions Canada. Also, Pete is with GeoEnviroPro. Um, just before I hand it over to Pete, please remember to send any questions that arise for you uh, to me using, using the questions feature on your GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll take them up at the end. So with that, I pass it over to you, Pete. Thanks, Scott. So uh, that's me. That's uh, on the slides and now on webcam. Uh, so good morning. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday here in Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, just uh, if you're keeping track, uh, congratulations on the 60th anniversary of the discovery of the structure of DNA by Crick and Watson, uh, based on a lot of data from a woman named Rosalind Franklin, but uh, pretty, uh, pretty huge day when humanity figured out why things work the way they work. Um, speaking about why things work the way they work, I want to talk about how PRBs work today. Uh, I have a day job. I am kind of a quiet um, junior partner in GeoEnviroPro, but uh, to make real money, I, I, you have to have uh, other lines of, 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 of uh, employment. And I work as a contractor. We build a number of PRBs. And lately, I've been getting a lot of requests for budgetary estimates. People are interested in permeable reactive barrier technology. They want to include it in their remedial options assessments and very, very happy to help them out, but there's some pushback because people are confused about why sometimes the dollar value is much higher than they were thinking. Uh, they're also concerned when I have to give them a really wide range. So I wanna review uh, what PRBs are, uh, then how we install them because that influences what, they, what the prices look like, and then talk about how by working together, consultants and contractors, uh, even at the remedial options stage, we can get kind of a tighter estimate so you can make good decisions in those remedial options assessments. Why would you take advice from a contractor? Um, well, in this case, it's because we put in more PRBs than pretty much anybody else. So there's one or two other companies that put in a similar number of PRBs, um, dozens. Perhaps the other thing that makes us interesting, which is unique, is that we're one of the few shops that actually puts them in using basically any major method. We, we do biopolymer slurry trenching. We also do continuous trenching. We also do soil mixing, right? So we have no bias as to method. Um, and this comes up later because when you ask for a quote that is so tightly defined that it presupposes the method, I have, I have some limitations on what I can give you. I end up giving alternate proposals, unsolicited alternates. Uh, for what? Well, it's three baseline, get on the same page with what are, the, what are permeable reactive barriers, why are people interested? So many of you as consultants have sites where you have an ongoing groundwater problem. Uh, it's gonna be a while before you take out the source area, or you've taken out the source area, there's still a distal plume that's dissipating, uh, or maybe you just wanna wall off your property from something nasty that's coming in from upgradient. One of your options for a wide variety of contaminants is to bury reactive media along the groundwater flow path. So as the groundwater flows through that barrier under the natural hydraulic heads, uh, it's remediated. It chemically reacts in the barrier or biologically reacts in the barrier and you get immobilization or destruction the groundwater passing through the barriers clean. Um, we can provide a lot of guidance on when this is an appropriate technology for a site. Certainly it's not a panacea, uh, nothing is. Uh, you can look at uh, uh, plenty of screening criteria. And at the end of this presentation, I've got a lot of references for those of you who are interested in delving into that. We have through GeoEnviroPro done training on PRB selection and design before. We can do it again if there's interest. But suffice it to say that if it's not crazy deep, you have a uh, reasonable groundwater flow, so not too fast, not too slow, and the contaminant can't be reacted away, it might be worth looking at. And you can look at it for a really wide variety of contaminants. The point of this table is not that you should try to read that quickly right now. Uh, you can take this home with you later. The point is that uh, PRBs are a demonstrated remedial technology with about 35 years of experience now to treat a wide variety of groundwater problems. Uh, chlorinated solvents is the, the original one, the granddaddy, we use zero valent iron pretty extensively for that. But certainly people are building effective barriers for dissolved phased hydrocarbons. Uh, they're building effective barriers for free phase hydrocarbons. Uh, very interesting applications are available in acid mine drainage, uh, high metals concentrations. Um, and why people would be very interested in this technology is because in many cases, especially with a large distal plume that's dissipating slowly, you need to do something, but there's not a lot you can do and you end up driven back to pump and treat. 
And so pump and treat systems can sometimes be put in cost effectively, but you now have to run this thing for many, many years. And so PRBs are very, very compelling. If your pump and treat solution is either uneconomic because you're on a riverbank and you're pumping is trying to dewater the river, or it's uneconomic because it's going to run for like 20 years. Um, look at the PRBs. Because well, with PRB, we have a higher upfront cost. We put the material in the ground, but then we just leave it there. You can actually build over the top. All the main, the only O&M we're doing is to monitor this thing over time. And so uh, depending on how you calculate net present value, if your groundwater problem is going to be more than five years or more than 10 years, the PRB can be incredibly compelling from a cost perspective. It's also very interesting because, like I said, you can pave over the top, right? As long as monitoring shows that it continues to work, we're all good. So how do you build PRBs? And this is relevant to you as consultants because it influences um, barrier width. It influences barrier cost. The first PRBs were just installed using conventional earthworks. And frankly, if it's shallow and the ground is stable, go for it. Uh, simple, clear, readily available equipment, bomb proof. But if you're getting deeper than six meters or so, if you're having unstable ground, if you have high groundwater, you might need an alternate installation technology. Uh, with conventional excavation, you end up doing things like driving caissons, excavating with the caisson, placing the reactive backfill, and then overlapping caissons. It ends up being ridiculously expensive. So the two other main technologies, so the main technologies are up here in green. The top three are conventional earthworks. The two main technologies we use when you can't put it in easily using conventional earthworks are biopolymer slurry trenching and continuous trenchers. There are other methods and we continue to try to develop other methods, but generally they're not cost effective. There are a lot of advantages to BP methods and to continuous trenching methods. Direct placement, it's the, the original method. And if you're shallow and it's stable, it's probably the best. These are some of the only photos I have that aren't GSI photos. They're from the University of Waterloo for a barrier, a bio barrier for acid mine drainage going in Sudbury, uh, a Falcon Bridge facility. Uh, it treats acid mine drainage. You need to go, uh, if the ground holds open, upper left, no worries, dig a hole, fill it. Uh, if you need to go deeper, this is when it becomes more complicated and problematic. So in the bottom right here is a classic example of what happens when you have to go deeper, but you insist on using conventional technologies. They had to bench out so they could still reach down. They got a trench box in there to try to control trench stability. And I mean, we can go much deeper than that, right? You can drive sheet piling. But now, as you can imagine, we have some health and safety concerns. We have increasing cost. And we also have uh, other complicating factors. Driving sheet piles can, for example, smear a clay layer over other strata and confuse the issue of hydraulic permeability going through the wall. So the two big methods, BP trenching we'll talk about first, and then we'll talk about continuous trenching. BP trenching, biopolymer slurry trenching, we use a degradable slurry to hold the trench open, we dig under the slurry, and then we carefully tremie in the reactive backfill, and then we, uh, we let the slurry degrade. Or honestly, I want to get paid quick, so I'm going to add things to the slurry to degrade it artificially quickly. We can actually get it degraded in a question of days. Um, if you leave it to itself, it's going to be weeks max. This is what it looks like. So that thick slurry uh, is so thick, it kind of cakes out. It's not escaping much from the trench. It doesn't bleed at a huge rate. So we can keep a, a positive slurry head that the hydrostatic pressure is then counterbalancing the active earth pressure. This trench stays open, right? And then building the barrier is pretty simple. Uh, frame number one, far left-hand side. They're carefully tremying in that material. It's displacing the majority of the support slurry. Once we've tremied in all our material, uh, point number two here is we, if we want the, slurry to, the residual slurry to go away quickly, we might add some uh, enzymes, we might add a, a mild oxidants, things like hydrogen peroxide to accelerate the breaking process. And then frame three, we just recirculate to prove that we've established hydraulic permeability. And then at that point, frame four, all you're left with is what you put, had us put into the trench. Alternative to that, under very specific ground conditions, is to use a continuous trencher or a one-pass trencher single pass trencher it has a variety of names uh, there are actually several contractors that do this including ourselves everybody knows to wind but it's important to understand that we do it uh iron horse in, in calgary i believe does it um it's not it's, it's not a proprietary technology and um, but what it is is a giant chainsaw that cuts the soil and so what you can do here top frame here is a masterbrook uh rig is the giant chainsaw cuts through the soil it's raking up the spoils and depositing it to the side of the rig you can put a big box behind that beam and start to backfill in that box. 
and then that apparatus is cut or dragged through the subsurface. So you don't actually have a huge section of trench open at any one time, and it's a continuous process. The excavation the backfilling is one operation. So if that machine settles in at a steady depth and just goes, production rates can be amazing. Um, the reason I'm using the Masterbrook photo is that I actually don't have a picture of our, our, our BSI unit, a BSY unit with the box on it. That's the lower frame. Uh, that one is actually building a very cost-effective soil bentonite barrier wall. Um, observations on these trenchers, uh, they're good at shallow depths, they're good in loose soils. They have a couple of severe drawbacks. They don't cope well with tough ground, they don't cope well with boulders. You break a chain, you get the beam stuck, it really ruins the whole job. Uh, in the beginning days of trenchers, it was kind of an open joke that They've walked off more jobs than they finished. Certainly the technology is better nowadays, but you do need to select it for appropriate ground conditions. The other one, uh, it doesn't cope well with, uh, with varying key depths. It takes a lot of jiggery pokery to change the beam length and the chain. And um, it, the chain is gonna control the trench width. The chain and the box are gonna control the trench width. And it, you know, very often people would specify a three foot wide barrier or a one meter wide barrier. Um, I probably don't have, depending on your depth, I don't have a chain and box set up to cut one meter. You're gonna have to deal with the chain width I have. So if they're so persnickety and they're so limited in width, why are people using them so often? It's because under ideal ground conditions, shallow, sandy, loose, uh, it can, I've actually, there is one job we evaluated it, it it's 10 times faster to install it. So long straight run, steady depth, it was 10 times faster to go with the trencher. What about alternate technologies like soil mixing? We're trying, we're trying to make it applicable. It's just not there yet, except for a few specialty applications where you're gonna go very, very deep. Um, we have done soil mix barriers. It, they're just way more expensive than the other technologies. And the other problem they have is that they remix the native soil materials. So very often the consultant design requires a very high permeability through the reactive zone. So you, you do full replacement in the barrier. It's a coarse sand plus the reactive material. With the soil mixing, you got the reactive material, you might get a little sand, but we're remixing the native material. So you're not gonna get two or three orders of magnitude difference in the hydraulic permute, in the conductivity. Um, used to be a problem getting enough material into the ground. That has been solved by a few contractors, but not all, so be aware of who you're talking to. Uh, certainly we are one of the contractors that can put 20% iron in the ground using soil mixing. Um, so that's probably not a primary installation technology. It's good for you to know that we could use it to repair an existing barrier or refresh an existing barrier. The other one is that if you did find a place where we could use it to install the barrier, we could move the same rig up gradient and hit the source area. Very few jobs are coming out that way. We are pushing, but we're not there yet with other technologies like jet grouting, uh, which uses high pressure fluid jets to cut the subsurface up. It also rejects a bunch of material at the subsurface, so we get higher replacement ratios. Uh, it's just not there. The, the pricing is very, very high. But for example, if you ever needed to go under a building at an angle, or you needed to go across like an active dam spillway where we could cut little eight inch holes, we can put the drill string down, you know, maybe the immense cost would be worthwhile. Also out there and worth talking about is to abandon the uh, idea of a discrete barrier and just do a lot of injections over a large area. So you don't have a 100% perfect barrier with 100% perfect capture, but if you do a large area with enough reactive material, you create an in-situ reactive zone. And we don't do those injection jobs. In some sites, that might be the ticket. And uh, call me offline, I can refer you to a couple of guys who do do injection work, and it has worked on some sites. So, okay, if we do so much of this work, and this stuff is very well established, and there's 30 years of experience, and you got all these pictures, then how come when you ask me for, for a price, it's either higher than you expected or really variable? And that is kind of the point of the talk today. Um, it's mainly because of what I'm wrestling with on the receiving end when I get the call for a budgetary quote, a budgetary estimate. And this is a real example. I just I changed a couple of details because um, this job is somewhat confidential, but I was asked a couple of weeks ago to do some budgetary estimates for a hypothetical barrier in Ontario. And, but all I was told was it's 18 meters deep. It's 0.5 meters wide, which is weird. We'll talk about why that's weird. And uh, 18 meters deep, about 70 meters long. Okay, and it has to be 20% iron. That's what they say, 0.5 meters wide, 20% iron. So, okay, I'm wrestling with this. Oh, also, by the way, the standard penetration test, the blow count data, the soil, the deeper soil is N equals 60. That's 60 blow count material. That's really tough, it's really compact, it's hard to dig. So, okay, what do I got here? Um, is it all N equals 60? 
Because if it's all n equals 60, I need a pretty burly machine to, to, to chew through that. If it's just a little bit of n equals 60, I might be able to work around that. Um, when you say it's 0.5 meters wide, I actually don't have equipment that does 0.5 meters wide. I'm either going to go with the trencher, which is controlled by the chain, or I'm going to go with some of my standard excavator buckets. Even if I have a, a special bucket made for you, if I'm going deep, I'm still constrained by the fact that I have to pass the knuckle and the boom on the excavator as it's digging, right? I have physical constraints on my trench width. So I'm going to have to spec this as a larger trench width. Do I have to have 20% iron in the larger trench width? The consultant hadn't thought it all the way out, doesn't have an answer for this because 0.5 meters at 20% iron, if I do 0.76 meters, can I prorate the iron content so it's the same tonnage over a larger volume? Or do I have to do 20% over the whole thing? Because this makes a huge difference in cost. How huge? The best case on this job, assuming reasonable digging conditions, I can prorate the iron, et cetera, et cetera, probably do it for about $800,000, um, right? But just with the paucity of data that I have, if I protect myself by making conservative assumptions, it's 1.6 million. The receiver of this estimate wasn't particularly happy. It's not very useful information. Oh, it could be 800,000, that's great. Yeah, but it might be 1.6 million. I mean, then how do you compare that to another technology? But it, it's based on the data that I've gotten to do the budgetary hunt. Now, good news is we can work together to get this much narrower and um, much more optimistic by focusing on these, these two key issues. One is the red zone up here. You see that red zone, the 337,000? That's the basically the reagent cost. In this case, it was a iron barrier for chlorinated solvents. So that's my basically my iron cost with a few other bits and bobs. And we can really narrow that down. The other one is light blue and darker blue, which combined is coming out to almost $400,000 is related to equipment selection. And this has to do with, do you understand the geotech? Can you tell me really what digging conditions are gonna be like? So size matters, right? Um, if it's a, you're going to six meters, uh, I can use standard buckets, uh, ground conditions are particularly difficult. I can rent an excavator from United and even use it for biopolymer slurry trench if I had to, right? Uh, and it might be 250 bucks to get to the site. Um, I don't know, seven grand, eight grand a month, okay? Compare that to, no, Pete, it's N equals 60 the whole way down. I need you to go to 18 meters. Um, this is really tough material. At that point, I'm mobilizing in a 110 ton excavator that comes in on eight separate trucks. The MOBE is like, well, I quoted it for a job in, uh, in Alberta. It was $56,000 to get the unit onto the site. And then the tracks are coming in separate from the chassis to assemble it on site uh, and then disassemble it at the end of the job was like another 50 grand, right? It totally changes the estimate. Um, you've seen trenchers, you think they're neat. I think they're neat too. Do I have long linear runs? Do I have sandy conditions? Can you assure me I'm not gonna hit boulders? Cause then, then I can bring the trencher in on the estimate and the high production rate can benefit us. Second thing, content is really key. key. I, I, you remember that big red piece on the pie chart? The iron cost was really, it's often 40% of the barrier cost. Um, bio barriers are better because you tend to use materials like mulch, but we also see people specifying $5 a kilogram, $10 a kilogram proprietary carbon materials. Man, that that's a big chunk of money. And so like just as an iron example of how content will drive your costs, uh, this is actually, we're starting a job, a PRB in, uh, in Toronto on March 15th. Uh, and this is from the estimate that we did in the procurement process for that. Iron vendor number one wanted 2,900 bucks per cubic meter for one iron spec. Iron vendor number two wanted 3,400 bucks per cubic meter for a different iron spec. If we agree on the iron spec, I have a lot more certainty on the pricing. And just even look at that, right? Yeah, I need to talk to multiple vendors to really give you uh, what the best price could be. And then come back, on top of that variance, come back to the trench width issue. Um, you, your idea in your head was it's 0.5 meters wide, which I'm struggling with again, because I don't actually have any equipment that's 0.5 meters wide. Um, if we do 20% iron in that 0.5 meter wide barrier, and I use the low priced iron, I'm 365,000 bucks. These are the example math calculations, not the pretty picture of the loader, okay? Alternate scenario, if I'm trying to protect myself, um, I don't want to low, I don't want to low ball you, if I use my, my best trench width, which is in this case was 0.76 meters to clear the boom and everything, but I still use 20% iron, and there's some ambiguity about whether you could use the low price because it was a different grade, 
Um, so I use a high price iron. So larger trench, trench high price iron, 20% iron over the larger trench, $650,000. The difference in price between those two scenarios is almost equal to the price of the, of the low price scenario. So this is kind of the point of doing a little 20 minute talk on it today is to get this, uh, I'd like to see you guys consider PRBs more often. When they work, they're really neat. Um, but if we're gonna build any, they need to, they need to come off well and, they, and accurately in the, in the remedial options assessments. And so for that to happen, you know, we need to have a little bit more discussion, maybe a little bit more thought needs to be given to the to configuration and the flexibility in the configuration. Um, you guys in doing the environmental investigations have to collect geotechnical data. We, if the geotech is unknown, we have to be conservative. We don't want to take the risk for unknown ground conditions, right? Um, so it's good to do a little extra geotechnical characterization so you can say with a reasonable degree of certainty that these are going to be the digging conditions. Then knowing the digging conditions, having looked at the configuration, let's look at optimizing the width and the optimizing the reagent. Are you open to 15% iron and 0.76 meters instead of 20% on 0.5? And this leads us to kind of a final point, which is really seriously open-ended, maybe not appropriate for today, which is how should you build these things and how should you design them? On the one hand, I'd like to give you guys all our design experience, um, but I'd also, you know, my main line of work is to go out and do the job. So we're not really a free design service. Um, we're happy to provide a lot of data in the hopes that it gets utilized. Um, and we're happy to get budgetary quotes all day long because hopefully that gets us into the bidding process. But there's this kind of, I don't know what we do, right? I don't want to get conflicted out of being able to bid the work in the end. And in fact, my emphasis is on bidding the work in the end. So I don't want to be totally mired in the design process. Um, give it some thought. Give it some thought. Look at some of the references. I would say it'd be nice to see design build projects come forward where the contractor gets involved early and actually helps evolve the value engineer the design. But you know, this whole issue of uh, design build management and selling a design build concept to a to an owner, I think is a little bit beyond the 20 minutes we have today. So we have and are happy to supply technical papers. I think I, you guys have my contact info. You can contact me at my day job, you can contact me through GeoEnviro Pro, you can we can be LinkedIn buddies whatever like happy to to support the industry we do a lot more stuff than prbs we do all sorts of crazy stuff so let's make a connection um stepping away from the sales talk there's a lot of fairly objective material online that i commend to you especially the interstate technology and regulatory council documents and then i've also we're also building into this for you guys to take home uh, some useful papers I don't want you to read this on screen right now. The reason we want them out there is that later when you're looking at a design, skim through this list uh, where the paper titles look applicable, stick them in Google, right? And then usually you can find a way by hook or by crook to get a copy. With that, hopefully we have a couple of questions because we're really doing a lot of budgetaries, but I'm not seeing a high conversion rate from the budgetaries to the actual installations and where this stuff works, it's awesome. So why aren't we doing more installations? What do we have for questions, Scott? We have a few, Pete. Nice. Um, can a PRB be used adjacent to marine waters where tidal pumping in the groundwater is significant? Uh, I'm gonna give the answer as a qualified yes, because we have constructed them next to, we constructed them next to a number of water bodies where there is, whoever asked the question is, great. They're, they're very bright and they're on to some key issues. Um, where there's no pumping, one of the sweet spots for a PRB is next to a water body when the alternative is pump and treat. Because if you have something that's flowing up into a river, for example, and you try to contain that with pump and treat, typically what's happening is you're also drawing from the riverside. And so you have these very high pumping requirements to get hydraulic capture. And that's where impermeable barriers and PRBs are really sweet. Um, they just put, we I, I can give you plenty of project cases where we're within a few meters of the marine, of the aquatic environment. What the questioner asked specifically is what about in a marine environment where you've got tidal pumping? Because when, then what's happening is instead of having one way flow through the barrier, periodically flow is reversed. And I think the answer to it is you need to look at the extent of tidal pumping and need to model what the actual, um, the actual particle tracking is going to look like because under a lot of scenarios, yes, the, you have, the pressure is transmitted. You see the, the, the uh, you'll see variations in the, the, for example, the monitoring well uh, levels. But in terms of actual particle trajectories, the particle trajectories aren't necessarily 
reversing and traveling upstream, uh, they're, they may actually be just simply stalling during that part of the tidal cycle. So you'd wanna consider some particle tracking type assessments of the flow. Um, we didn't get involved, but I can hook you up with the geniuses that were involved with the permeable reactive barrier that is at the PEC site in North Vancouver. I believe if memory serves that it was originally a Hamera design, I think Quantum did the original installation. I think John Clark did the original installation. And anyhow, those two guys, John Clark and uh, Eric Pringle, who is ex Hamera and 10 times smarter than me, uh, they both work for a company called Milestone Contracting. And I believe they did do, they have done a recent subsequent phase on the PEC barrier. So within our BC community, there are people who have practical experience with building in a tidally influenced environment. Any Great. other questions? Yeah, a few more. Um, is the quality of iron and other additives to the PRB screen for priority contaminants and any other exotic like re radioactivity? Uh, I mean, it can be, right? There, there are basically three main vendors for the iron material that we're using on a routine basis and we can get certificates of analysis. Um, there has historically been some concern about, hey, what are the metals in the metal? But an uh, interesting thing about iron barriers is that they actually tend to immobilize, uh, not all, but most uh, most metals, that they don't typically create much of a groundwater problem. Uh, if you think about that, I showed you the Falcon Bridge example, the old AMD barrier. Uh, that case and many other cases have shown that where the barrier may not be the, <clears throat> the barrier may not actually be the, the source of secondary contamination in groundwater, but you can cause very large changes in geochemical conditions, which can mobilize material that's immediately downgrading into the barrier. But what we have seen through, you know, 30 years of implementation data is in the vast majority of cases, in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I'm not personally aware of a case where those effects were not attenuated within a very short flow path. Um, I don't want to dismiss the concern. I know it's a real concern and you would have to work your regulator through it, uh, but it really has not been an issue in installed barriers. Um, yeah. Uh, radioisotopes, I actually have not looked at the radioactive constituents of the iron. It's a byproduct of slag furnaces. And so I wouldn't expect to see norm in it. Um, that I just, I can do some research. I, I'm not, I don't have a good answer. I, I don't, it doesn't, in 30 years, I, I don't see a lot of case studies worried about that. Perhaps actually the, perhaps the contributor has something and that would be neat if they could maybe fire me the paper because I'd be very interested in it. Um, last point on barrier material. Uh, it is a company called Tursus is out there and uh, they are talking about a new extremely high surface area iron material and we have not yet worked with it, but that's very interesting because it is uh, it is not the ground byproduct of a slag furnace. It is their proprietary manufacturing process. And I'd be interested in what their controls are like and what certificates of analysis they can provide. I'm sure their costs are insanely high, but what they're currently saying to us on the contractor side is that you could use much less uh, because it's so much more reactive. Good. Uh, Pete, can you comment on the overall success rate of PRBs? Um, we actually did a PRB training seminar. We can do one again if anybody's interested through GeoEnviroPro. Uh, and in it, we discussed where they failed. Um, generally, about 90% of them appear to have no... The, well, here's, here's, there's a little bit of a data gap. Originally, PRBs were an innovative technology, and they were very carefully tracked. There were a couple of kind of clearinghouses where everybody was contributing their, their project data. Uh, that really tapered off coming into 2000, the 2000s. I think the last repository got major updates in like 2007 or something. People, they, be, they got so mainstreamed that the, there's no longer the, the separate uh, archived collections of, of consolidated project data. Um, however, there are hundreds of projects that have been explored in various papers and conferences and retrospective meta papers and so on. And so basically about 90% of them appear to be fine. Uh, the failures in PRB world appear to be predominantly through basically design error. Um, the primary failure mode for a PRB is that the conceptual site model was inadequate. And so something like a seasonal fluctuation in groundwater flow direction was neglected. Uh, and so then the, in many cases, the, the 
in a small set of barriers where they've had problems, it ends up being things like the groundwater actually ends up in the winter. It flows that way and not this way. Um, it speaks to the importance of having a robust conceptual site model. Um, there have been a few barrier failures where the installation was faulty. I, we've actually been called in to fix a couple of barriers. Uh, that has to do with quality control at the time of installation. Um, the other, this is interesting. Sometimes the trencher is a little bit blind. The, the slurry trench, you have more ability to actually go into the trench and see what you're doing than the trenching method. Um, but trenchers work fine when you have very rigorous quality control on them. But we have been called into a couple of cases where post-installation coring of somebody else's wall showed gaps in the iron. Uh, the good news is we can just we can remedy those sections of wall by over excavating them. Or what I'd like to get out there is uh, actually try to remedy those sections of wall using in situ soil mixing. Uh, we've only done it on a couple of sites so far, but it, it's really if the mobilization cost works out, it's a neat solution to that failure mode. I can't do anything for the other failure mode, the one where the groundwater flow direction wasn't predicted correctly. In that case, we're going to have to, I guess, go in and build a whole new barrier. Great. Uh, we have a few more questions. I think we'll we'll hang around and answer them. Uh, those of you that want to want to stay with us, uh, please do. Uh, another one here, Pete. Is a trencher able to be used for clay soils, or really only useful for sand? Assuming no. Uh, Assuming no, we'll just finish the question. Assuming no boulders, what if any sized rocks are workable? Uh, it depends on the size of the trencher. Uh, our machine's about 40 tons and about 450 horsepower. So it's good for, uh, it can work through, I, I'd want us, the two things on the clay is, uh, again, getting grain size, doing basic index testing, getting geotechnical data is very important. But the two things we'd be worried with is a very, very dense clay or like a clay till, a very hard clay till could be a problem. Tills also very often, depending on where you are in the country, can have surprise rocks, which are not cool. Uh, the, all, the switch side of that is that if it's really mucky, if it's too soft, um, it sticks to everything and can be an excavation problem in its own right. But if it's not too hard and it's not undiggably mucky, um, the trencher can deal with reasonable clays. There are, like the wind has the biggest machines in the world. Uh, they've got, I think they've got one machine that is somewhere north of 1400 horsepower. Uh, they certainly claim that they can go through much burlier equipment that we can go through, a uh, burlier um, material that we can go through. I just counter suppose that if you get that quote, can you call me for a BP slurry trench quote? Because um, the mob cost on a 1500 horsepower machine versus my excavator, I still can probably beat them. All right. Um, are there PRBs wider than two meters? Uh, difficult to construct. Um, we've been asked a couple of times to look at extremely wide PRBs. Um, <laughs> man, I got to stop talking about the competition. Uh, DeWind is experimenting with an extremely long chain machine. Um, I don't know how well it's worked. Uh, they get to be very, very complex uh, undertakings. We would probably propose to build separate parallel barriers if we wanted to go much beyond 1.5 to 2 meters. Uh, depends on ground conditions. I'd really want to look at ground stability, but um, we have a lot of flexibility with biopolymer slurry trenching in geometric configuration. But whoever asked the question has apparently been doing this work for a while because they know that uh, you get deeper than uh, you get wider than two or three meters, and trench stability does become a serious consideration. And also the excavation sequence. It is easier for us when the excavator just works dead backwards and is cutting a single trench than having the excavator try to cut a wider trench as he works backwards. Uh, depending on the scenario, I might counter propose either overloading, uh, either increasing the concentration of reactive material. Uh, or actually doing two separate parallel barriers. Okay, can you mention funnel systems and PRBs done using geoprobe rigs? So funnel systems, um, you, somebody, wow, man, I, I'm actually now super self-conscious because I'm getting the impression that the audience is smarter than the speaker, um, which is always dangerous <laughs> for the speaker. Um, but yeah, somebody drew the connection there on the iron cost that why am I putting in a 70 meter long iron wall when I could put in a really cheap guide walls of soil bentonite? And they're seriously cheap. 
um, and then just put a reactive gate in the middle, a funnel and gate system. Uh, no complaints about that. Look at the site, right? Um, it, if you Absolutely. If you have to build a continuous wall with a higher iron content, it's probably cheaper to build a funnel and gate system. Funnel and gate systems were originally uh, really popular in the literature. There was a lot of design consideration for them. In our experience, people seem to be asking for more continuous barriers. And, I, I, and I'm not 100% clear on the total shift in design paradigm, but a couple of considerations. With a funnel and gate system, the, the gate has to, you're now taking groundwater that's going across a cross section like this, and you're gonna ram it through a gate like this. So that gate has to be far more permeable than the native material, and it can't clog. Um, if it starts to clog or it's not permeable, what happens is you get groundwater mounding coming into this constriction and the plume will actually dive under the gate. Or you can also, if you have extreme enough mounding, you can start to have problems with you lifting the water table and you're, you know, I don't know, you, you all of a sudden you got wetlands on a site that you don't want to have wetlands on, right? The other one is that if you have a flow constriction, at some point, if you get the mounding and the backup, you get uh, flow is going to be diverted around the wings. But certainly there are many effective funnel and gate systems built and they can be effectively built. You just want to fully understand the conceptual site model so that your wings are wide enough that you're not going to get bypass, your gate is robustly designed so you're not going to create a mounting problem in diving. Um, really neat, that hasn't been done a ton in North America, but there's a lot of project, well not a lot, there's a modest product experience in Europe and actually a Rocky, Rocky Mountain Arsenal in the United States, they, they played with this as well is to do things like block walls, for sure. You can also do drains. We can build high permeability drains, subsurface drains, and bring everything into uh, gravity flow replaceable reactors. Um, and in fact, actually, there's a company in Europe that has a proprietary uh, system. They put carbon cans in the ground and, and then basically collect the water and flow them passively through the carbon cans. Um, haven't done a lot of it in North America. It would be interesting to look at. Uh, certainly has been demonstrated to work. Some projects did have problems with finicky plumbing. Um, if you start to bury these reactors and they have plumbing systems and siphons and valving and so on, you remember the whole point of this thing is we're gonna stick it in the ground and try to walk away for 10 years. So if you have any problems with corrosion uh, or with um, clogging, um, maybe this high zoot expensive subsurface passive plumbing approach is not the right deal. Second part of the question was about technical funnels and gates. What was the other part of the question? Let's see if I can find it. Uh, hey, Scott, what was the other part of that question? Oh, sorry, Pete. I had my sound off. Um, I think it was a uh, comment on uh, PRBs done using GeoProbe rigs. Uh, most of those are injection based. So that's uh, so instead of uh, instead of building a continuous barrier that is going to intercept everything flowing through it. One of the neat things about a PRB is that you've got a strata, you've got vertical, um, you've got vertical differences in contaminant concentration and also in mobility because for example you have a silt stringer and then you have a little bit of sand and then you got some silty clay and then you got a little bit of sand with the barrier i cut across the whole bloody thing and everything that flows through the barrier has to interact with the barrier in a homogeneous for in a more homogeneous formation uh if it's permeable instead of trying to intercept everything through this giant drain gate wall concept you can just poke in a lot of little holes and pump in reagents. Now, when you pump in those reagents, they're going to preferentially go on preferential flow paths. So you're not going to get a homogeneous distribution. But it's so cheap with the geoprobe to put a lot of material in the ground that you could take a large lateral extent and put a, a lot of material in the ground. And in general, a part of uh, an iota of contamination flowing into that zone will at some point contact the reagent. Um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get in a situation of endorsements, but certainly, uh, for example, Vertex, Bruce Tonicliffe's company, uh, can speak very adeptly to this. I think Milestone can as well. There, I don't want to get into an endorsement situation. There are a number of very good companies that do a lot of injection-based work. It is appropriate for some sites. 
The other thing is we haven't seen a huge amount of adoption in Canada, and I wonder if it's because of um, language uh, issues, is uh, there is a, in Denmark uh, and then in the United States, there's been some really interesting work done with controlled fracturing. And I think that one of the issues, there used to be a company called uh, FrackRate, and I believe they're now doing business as geotactical remediation. And I think they had to change their name. I could be wrong. If anybody from FrackRate is on the phone, please jump in. I, I don't want to mislead anybody. But I think one of the things they found is that people didn't like the idea. Fracking has become a bad word. In reality, um, you can control fracturing in some geologic materials. And so one of your options is if you don't want to dig a continuous wall, you might be able to drill, start fractures, for example, by jetting, load those fractures with hydraulic pressure and get controlled fracturing so you have an inter intersecting fracture network that you filled with reactive media. Uh, definitely worth looking at. I'm not your guy. Um, I'm trying to think of who does it besides geotactical, but they're the name that comes to mind. Okay. Pete, how are you for time? Ah, uh, man, I'm, I, this is business. Like I, I could talk about this stuff all day. You should probably, if, if people want to hang on for more questions, we can, but do you want to just kind of tease them about what, what they should tune into next week? Yeah. Um, well, I'll get onto that in a second. Why don't I, why don't I pose one more question to you? And, and then we'll cap it, and you can respond offline to the remaining, yeah, yeah. remaining okay, questions. Cool. How does that sound? Okay. I do. Um, can you touch on PRB maintenance related to spent media and fouling? Um, fouling was a major concern in the, if you look at the literature and if you look at the evolution of PRB designs, a lot of the early concerns about PRBs uh, from regulators were based on what is the lifespan and whether they're going to cl clog. Um, on the in the laboratory scale, when they were doing column tests. Clogging actually comes up uh, reasonably common. In the field, I, I should go back and check. There are a couple of major um, survey papers where they surveyed a large number of PRB jobs. And this is where I, I get the information to discuss re real failure modes. And I don't offhand recall of a case where an actual full-scale barrier has failed because of a clogging issue. Um, Certainly, we are concerned. Actually, what we're more concerned about now in a field scale is, um, is especially with iron, is having the reactivity consumed by non-target groundwater constituents. Uh, and this also happens with other reactive media as well. Um, with granular activated carbon being used to sorb hydrocarbons, for example, if you put a napple onto carbon material, it blinds off the carbon pores and it's no longer effective for uh, for sorption of dissolved phase. Uh, there's a workaround for that actually. And we could talk about it if anybody's interested. With iron, one of the big problems has been high nitrate concentration in groundwater. So high nitrate and to some extent high hardness, um, mostly high nitrate. High nitrate, when it hits the walls, it kind of passivates the iron surface. Uh, to the extent that uh, Golder did a design for one job in Australia, which we, we built, where they put a sawdust wall up gradient of an iron wall. And so the sawdust wall was a bioreactor that was a denitrified, it, it took out the nitrate, denitrification. Um, and then that groundwater stream, which still had all the chlorinates in it, went through an iron barrier. Um, so that's, the answer is you gotta look at the geochemistry. Uh, certainly you can't ignore the geochemistry. Geochemistry should be part of screening of PRB's applicability. Um, but if you're not seeing things like crazy high nitrate, it might be okay, right? There are plenty of barriers that work perfectly well. Refreshing or renewing barriers has always been a concern. The barriers tend to be, originally the idea is to put these barriers in with a design lifespan of maybe 15, 20 years. What we see is that the conservatism in the design has led many of those barriers to be functional far in excess of their original design intent. Um, there have been cases where high concentration sections of the plume intercepted a barrier and depleted the barrier's reactive capacity in a very small place, so basically burnt through. And um, this has to do with your conceptual site model and understanding whether you do have high vertical heterogeneity in the contaminant concentrations. Um, good news is we can fix barriers. We can go in and rework just that section of the barrier. Uh, in terms of renewing the overall barrier, there have been a few jobs that have gone in and done that. It's not very common. 
Uh, certainly where, it, uh, where we see the most interest, is, the bio barriers have much shorter design lifespans than the iron barriers. And so bio barriers are in there getting replaced, but the bio barrier material tends to be things like mulch and uh, limestone pea gravel. So the reacting cost isn't a big deal. It's more an issue of construction. Um, yeah, I think the takeaway is you need to look at the geochemistry and you need to look at the design of life on the front end. There have been a few screw ups where the conceptual site model wasn't adequate, but we can fix those screw ups. Okay, great. There's a, Pete, there's a number of additional questions. Why don't, why don't you respond to those directly offline? Okay. So everybody that's left a question that didn't get answered today is going to get a response direct from Pete. Thanks for the thanks for the tremendous number of questions, everybody. That was a good uh, Q and A. Um, before we leave you, I'd just like to highlight some of the things we've got coming up over the next uh, couple of months between now and the end of spring. Um, of course, we're going to keep running these weekly webinars uh, or these weekly free talks through May 30th. Uh, we've got one coming up next week on habitat assessment uh, to support risk assessment that may be of interest to some of you. Also next week, we have a, a Guy Patrick is going to give a two-part uh, webinar, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, I believe, March 6th and 8th, on investigation and remediation of dry cleaner sites, which should be uh, interesting. Um, I, I, also, that, that, to chime in on that, so like I, yep. I work with Guy offline as well. Uh, and I think that actually, if you're dealing with it, anybody who tuned in today because they're interested in iron barriers for chlorinated solvents, should definitely take a look at uh, Guy's talk on the dry cleaners. He's dealing with chlorinated, and he will get into some alternates that may be more effective than a PRB, uh, including emulsified vegetable oil, which is extremely cost effective when it works. Right. Uh, we also have a number of other detailed webinars coming up uh, over the next several weeks, the, the dates of which will uh, unravel and be announced uh, as we go along. Another one I wanted to highlight is a live event we have coming up in Vancouver, April 26th. We're calling it the Risk Solutions Exposition. And what that's all about is a, you know, 20 years into the contaminated sites regulation, we wanted to bring everybody together and highlight success stories on where risk assessment and, and risk, manage, ran, risk management has been used in BC to uh, remediate contaminated sites. So hey, that'll hey, be Scott, an, yeah. Risk assessor Scott, um, I heard through the rumor mill because I'm not a CSAP. I'm not. I'm not that qualified, man. I heard through the rumor mill that in the giant crunch to get a certificates of compliance through last fall here in BC, 61% of the applications were risk based. I believe that's yeah. true. Increasingly, uh, and that yeah, that proportion is only increasing every year. More and more sites are being dealt with through risk risk assessment, risk management. So. Uh, we're, we've put out a, a call for submissions. Um, there's going to be platform presentations and poster presentations, a one-day event. Uh, the Ministry of Environment will be there. Contaminated Sites Approved Professional Society will be there as well. So, um, And we're going to live stream it, so you don't necessarily need to be a Vancouver-based uh, person to attend that. Um, you'll have an opportunity to connect uh, online. Uh, next slide, Pete. We should talk about membership, I suppose, just briefly before you go. Yeah, I, I, so it, today's, today's an easy one because it just meshes well. Um, I guess it's, it's, it does take a little effort to run these free Wednesdays. Um, and so we'd really be interested, I think, it's fair, fair point, Scott, that we're we want to get some people on board here. Uh, kind of a minimum financial investment. The other thing is really to get the people involved in for example, doing your own Wednesday talk uh, to try to build a, a community of practice, to reinforce that community of practice, to share some ideas. Um, so S Scott, I, I think uh, you've seen a couple of companies now have, have piled on. Um, yeah. Yeah. We are getting, we are getting people signing up. So we, uh, if you haven't, uh, we encourage you to, uh, and, you know, don't he hesitate to reach out to us for, for details on, on the benefits. Some of the benefits are on there, um, but we're happy to discuss them with you as well. Yeah, and I, I think that, it, so I, with these freebies, trying to get everybody on the same page, it's also entertaining and fun. Uh, we're still like the slot, the, 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 I think everybody gets like 48 hours of access to the webinar recording. 
Um, but if you want to bookmark this thing and come back to it a couple of months from now, if you could pitch in a little to, for example, pay for the archiving of the of the webinars, uh, you basically get access forever, right? And then it's you can go back and look at the library and pull some of the presentation materials. But um, you know that somebody's got to pay for that archiving and the infrastructure on the back end. Yeah. I guess that's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate you hanging with us late. Pete, any any final words? Uh, no, I hope I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, we I, I, two things that I'll bring up um, from my perspective. One is I am really interested in what you guys would want to know on the remediation side and on the contracting side. Uh, if I push what I want to say at you, it's not necessarily very engaging. If you guys have ideas for stuff for us, please. It makes it easier for everybody and more interesting send the ideas what are the questions what are the issues and then um, hopefully you know maybe you're sitting around with a couple of your friends watching this colleagues watching this and you have hopefully this sparks some discussions and if you get really excited about stuff that needs to be talked about in this professional community hey um you know consider putting on a wednesday webinar yourself like we'll we'll set everything up we'll talk you through it hand holding you can come here to our luxurious studio in victoria british columbia um, I'm in my garage. Um, you will make it work. Uh, the important thing I think is to have more good information uh, to elevate the level of practice, you know, not just in, in British Columbia, but perhaps uh, across the country. Well said. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. See you next time.